thing is kick it off now. Kevin, take it away. Okay, I just need to confirm first that I'm happy for you to record this. I think we've got that out of the way. Uh, so, Thank you all, uh, Nidhi. Thank you for bearing up with us during uh, those uh, technical issues. Hopefully, we're going to be joined by a few more people over the, the next few minutes. Uh, so I'm Kevin Ashley. Uh, I'm uh, director of the Digital Curation Centre, and I'm just going to give really uh, an introduction uh, to uh, this uh, week of events. Uh, of 10, well, actually 10 plus years of DMP and lines, I'll explain uh, in uh, a moment um, and describe where we came from uh, and to some extent where we're going. Um, and apologies to those of you who may have been at the Deliver RDM workshops that were taking place uh, a couple of weeks ago. You'll have heard some, but not all of this before. So a bit of context and history. I'm sure Many of you uh, are aware of what DMP Online is, but for those who aren't, it's a web-based service that helps researchers and those they work with create and maintain data management plans. It was launched uh, in 2010 uh, by the DCC, uh, shortly before I took up my post here. And that's why I say really in a sense it's 10 plus years. That was the, the launch, but clearly there was a period of development uh, and, and conception of the idea that went before that, but we're choosing the launch. Uh, to, to, to mark the celebration. We'll be hearing more about that later. Um, the DCC was then a national body funded by JISC, uh, which in a radical rebranding has now renamed itself as JISC. Um, and it was initially really aimed just at researchers. That was our target market and aimed at the UK because our funding uh, was uh, for the support uh, of, of UK research. But we saw international potential in this uh, from the outset, uh, and we wanted to demonstrate that this was something not just dealing with the peculiar requirements of UK research or UK funders, uh, but, but was uh, indeed internationalizable. And so we, we added in uh, the few requirements of US funders uh, uh, from the outset. It was free to use, and I think it's fair to say the international interest in it exceeded our initial expectations. And a lot of work then happened over the next five years we made major revisions, um, in, including services uh, and space for organizational administrators. We made the code uh, open source, and that was a part uh, of a general um, shift to openly licensing everything that the DCC was doing and making that our, our default. And we thought hard about how to attract um, the international funding to support an international service. We initially assumed that we'd be do that by going to national funding bodies and with some exceptions, I think we were wrong about that. You'll be hearing more about that later. And we could also see that that national UK funding was under threat and so we pursued other routes to support feature development and indeed we got our host university to invest some of its own money in paying some of the, the, the running and development costs at the time. And by the end of 2015, we had our first paying overseas customers and that brings in a whole bunch of things that aren't to do with co-development or anything else, they're to do with contracts and service agreements and legal uh, and administrative support. Um, and we knew by then that our predictions about losing national funding were right. And so fast forwarding to the present day, we've these figures are probably already out of date, but the last time we, I checked, um, it was being used by 203 organizations, 83 countries, and I'm gonna go through all of these um, numbers here but it's used uh, by research organizations and paid for uh, by over 50 so far. The code is still open source, um, uh, the DMP roadmap. It's still free to use for the end researchers, whether or not their organization or funder subscribes. Uh, and I think one other interesting tale about development here is that the team and the service team behind it is bigger than it ever was when we were being supported by national grant funding. And there you can see in that second map, that's those who are making use of that open source code base to support their own services. And I'll say a little bit more about that distinction. Um, between the two uh, in a moment. So I think there's a number of different aspects of DMP Online that we're gonna consider this week. It was a software development project that became open and collaborative. That involves lots of the issues that, that, that co-development uh, always has. If you've read the second man month, the, the sorry, the, the mythical man month, one of the, the classic texts uh, of, of uh, project uh, management uh, in software, you'll know about what in other contexts is described as the difficult second album problem. Uh, we've certainly gone through that uh, with DMP in line. It involves throwing a lot of things away, being ready to change the code, even though you don't necessarily want to change what the user sees or sometimes 
changing what the user sees, even if you don't necessarily want to change the code very much. But as well as that, it was a means of promoting behavior change amongst researchers, funders, and research organizations to think of data management planning as a, a way of working that helped you do better research uh, and, and produce better results for society as a whole. It's also a service that moved from grant support to self-sustaining support with all of that implies. And each of these things, the code, the behavior change, the service aspects are interlinked, uh, uh, but different. And to give one example, really, there are many services using that same open source code base, DMP roadmap. So DMP tool uh, in the USA, uh, DMP assistant and DMP online are all services, quite distinct services with different promises to their users, different ways of engaging with them that are all using a single source code base. There are many, many people to thank, uh, that, and we're going to be hearing from some of them this week. I guess some of it really is my predecessors in DCC management. When I came along here, I inherited something that was already in existence. Uh, so thanks, uh, I'm sure, to Chris Rusbridge, a previous director, Graham Pryor, who was the assistant director at Edinburgh, uh, and all those who originally sanctioned the idea that this was uh, a good thing to do. The funders who at different times have supported it, JISC, the European Commission, and the University of Edinburgh, the project and the service managers, Martin Donnelly, Sarah Jones, Patricia Herterick, uh, all of whom are glad are, are with us today and we're going to be hearing at different times about their uh, experiences. Um, a team of developers from John Patton and Fail, Adrian Richardson, Patrick McGann, uh, a team from Dean, Jimmy Angelakos, Jose Loret Perez, John Pinto, Colin Gormley, Martin Nicholson, Sam Rust, and Ray Carrick, who've been supported at various times by interns, Thea Haim, Killian Dunn, Damodar Soika. Um, I could mention that Sam actually could appear in that list twice because he began as one of our interns and is now uh, our, our lead developer. And it's great uh, when we, we see things happen uh, in that way. There's also the collaborators uh, on, on that uh, open source uh, project uh, and particularly really got to single out the team at the University of California Curation Center, Brian Riley, Stephanie Sims, Marissa Strong, John Chudaki, uh, uh, my counterpart over there, and Maria Pritzelis. Uh, and apologies if I've left anyone out from that particular list. I mentioned moving to the service, you know, we've got um, legal and admin issues to deal with. Uh, Lorna Brown uh, and David Matheson uh, in, in the U uh, University of Edinburgh legal team are really key to getting that uh, underway. It's involved user testing and um, indeed a help desk, Diana Sisu and Magdalena Gettler, I give particular credit for there. Uh, and many of you are familiar with Magdalena Drafiova, uh, who's our customer development manager. So what's gonna come this week? Well, you're gonna hear more about that service from its beginnings to its future. You'll hear more about those effects of behavior change we're trying to achieve from users, funders, and RDA working groups. And hopefully you'll get to talk with us and share your thoughts and plans on the future of data management planning and how it can benefit research. So I'm gonna hand over now to those of you, uh, to those who are gonna be able to cover all of these aspects for us this week. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and especially thank you for doing the list of names that I, I learned over the um, past few weeks when we did the, the preparations. I, um, I learned to appreciate how many people were involved in getting here. Um, next, it's on the agenda is actually myself giving. a quick overview of um, what's to come this week. Um, and again, welcoming you all um, officially to uh, our 10th year anniversary celebrations. Uh, I'm Patricia Hatterich. I'm the currently um, DMP Online pro project ma product manager. And um, if it wasn't obvious from my background yet, uh, I want to like highlight our hashtag 10 years DMP online. So if uh, you want to join the discussion and um, tweet about what's happening today and the whole week, um, please use that. So um, to celebrate 10 years in this like uh, weird times at the moment, um, what we have in, uh, in store for you are two panel sessions, uh, the one today and another one on Friday to wrap up the week. Um, 
plenty of blog posts. And uh, if we do manage uh, um, the other uh, odd surprise along the way as well. So I'm not gonna spoil yet, um, but uh, that you might see by Friday. Uh, our blog posts um, this week are really, um, I think, a, a testament to the great collaboration that um, the MP Online has been so far and the wonderful community that has grown around um, the tool, um, starting from um, basically our first partner, our first instance, the MP Tooley, who reflect on the collaboration um, with us since 2016. Um, NWO, the Dutch Research Council, who is our um, first funder subscribing to DMP Online, um, the team itself, we reflect on um, how we try to be engaged with the community um, during these times and uh, some of our subscribers um, from various universities, um, from King's College London, the University of Sheffield and St. George's University of London um, have also um, agreed to, to report a bit on how they have used DMP online um, over the last few months and years. And um, I think that the really beautiful aspect of this tool is that um, it is international. So our colleagues um, from Australia at ARDC are giving an insight into how they um, are using the MP online or data management plans uh, in, in Australia. So um, there's a lot to learn this week uh, about data management planning and how DMPs are used in various institutions. Um, most of these posts are up already, so you can go off and read, but we will highlight them uh, throughout the week. Uh, on Twitter, so keep an eye out on that, and that can be your breakfast, uh, lunch break, or whatever uh, uh, reading um, this week. Um, and just uh, 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 yeah, a little shout out that we're going to do what we do on Friday. Um, um, this today we'll we'll focus uh, on the past um, and also hear from um, quite a few funders that helped along the way and that we're collaborating with. Um, and on Friday, uh, again, we will um, focus on the future and collaboration um, with uh, our colleagues from CDL joining us. It's a bit uh, more friendly time for them, but I know that we have US colleagues here that joined uh, this early, so thank you for that. Um, colleagues from France and Canada will join. And um, the, uh, we will also hear from the RDA group on machine actionable data management plans. And because we want to look at the future of um, uh, data management plans and um, what it might bring, we are interested to hear your ideas and thoughts. Um, so if you can summarize in 40 characters what you think, um, and the, or what data management plans in, in the future might do, might look like, uh, you can let us know on Answer Garden. I'm pretty sure we make that link available in the chat in a second. If you need more than those characters, um, feel free to uh, put it on Twitter using the hashtag again, and um, we will pick all this up uh, on Friday in the session and hope we have um, uh, nice and interesting discussion about the future. Um, that's our plans for this week. Um, but yeah, let's go back into learning a bit more about the, the history of DMP Online and how we get to um, where we are at the moment. And uh, to do that, I'm handing over to Martin Donnelly, who was a first ever product manager for DMP Online. And um, will let us know about how it all started. If... Martin, are you okay to, to share? 
All good? Hi, yes, yes, thank you, Patricia. I'm, I'm here and, and hello to everybody. Um, uh, I'll now go ahead and share my screen. I hope this works. Um, so here we go. Could somebody just tell me if that is uh, visible? That yep. Yeah, that's fine. Right. We can see you on the screen. Okay, wonderful. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Patricia, Patricia, Magdalena, Kevin, and everyone for the invitation to uh, speak. I, I'm no longer a member of staff at the DCC, but um, as, as has been mentioned, I um, was the first um, product manager, although I never really had that. Um, we, we never had such professional terminology in place. I was just the person that people moaned to. Uh, I think that was my official title. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, DMP Online got started, and it didn't um, actually start with the software, it started somewhere else. So believe it or not, uh, once upon a time, uh, there were no DMPs. Um, the, 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 or there certainly was no um, uh, widespread movement towards them. Some projects had them, um, but they, they, they weren't required by many funders. Um, and that changed, and, and, and it changed possibly um, as a result of Liz Lyon's intervention with her consultancy report on dealing with data, uh, which said that each funded research project should submit a structured data management plan for peer review as an integral part of the application for funding. Um, so we uh, took a look at this and thought, okay, data management plans are going to be coming. Um, and uh, we um, made a, um, a work package at the DCC um, on data management plans. Um, and really all the, 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 our ambitions at the time uh, extended only to producing templates. Um, so DMP Online almost didn't happen. If you look down, um, the uh, development of an online planning tool was the ninth um, of, um, of 10 um, sub-deliverables uh, for um, work package B3.7. Um, and we, we put down for our description or, or when, uh, if achievable. So uh, this was only if we got towards the end of uh, all of the paper-based stuff. Um, so um, it, I guess we can count our lucky stars that we managed to get through uh, the first eight uh, of, uh, first seven or eight of these, um, of these stages. And we did in fact uh, develop an online planning tool. Um, so what we started off with was um, a draft template where, where Sarah Jones and I um, consulted uh, with, with various stakeholders and produced um, a long list of um, uh, categories and of specific questions which were derived from funders' data management plan uh, requirements or, or, or data management requirements, really, as they probably were. Um, and, and we... Um, made these generic and put them into a, a checklist. And the checklist was very basic, as you can see here. Um, and uh, the checklist uh, became um, the earliest DMP online homepage, uh, also known as Mock Up for John, which was the title of the file that I found when I was digging back uh, to show John Fail, who was the first uh, DMP online uh, developer, uh, what it is that we sort of had in mind, how the uh, generic questions from the checklist mapped to um, specific funder requirements, uh, where, the, where the user would enter their input and where advice or guidance as it's come to be known uh, would, uh, would be included. So that's, that, that's effectively the, the, the earliest DMP online homepage. And John turned it into something rather better than this. Uh, and the first, this is the first real DMP online homepage from 2010. Um, and um, it, John, uh, often protested at um, how much was being expected of him on little um, on little effort, and um, so consequently, um, after we had uh, launched the um, uh, the tool at the GISC conference, uh, I've given GISC their their, their fully capitalised uh, pre rebrand uh, name there because I think that's historically accurate. In, in I think it was April of 2010. Uh, where Sarah and I did um, did a just demo, which, uh, given our nerves, we scripted quite uh, <laughs> uh, quite thoroughly. Um, we started to get a bit more serious with it, and and this is another document which I found when I was sort of looking around in my files, uh, the first DMP online vision uh, and mission. Um, so as as um, Kevin mentioned, our initial uh, audience was the UK research community. So the first vision was to be the natural tool of choice that members of the UK research community use to create and maintain legitimate stroke acceptable data management plans for their work, according to templates endorsed by and produced through close liaison with research funders, HEIs, 
and other stakeholders. So the, the endorsement of the funders was something that was quite important to us. And that was something which, uh, again, we thought uh, would not be too difficult to come by, uh, but too deep. Um, so, so this was our, our, our vision and mission. And uh, we, we thought that um, at, attracting the attention and the approval of the research funders would be uh, relatively straightforward. We, we did end up getting the approval of some of them, but by no means uh, all for, our, for the approach that we had uh, taken. So that, that, that was a lesson learned there. Um, so version two, as I said, John uh, Fail was often complaining about the lack of resources and, and he brought on board a designer called Caleb Waldorf uh, to, um, to um, contribute to the, the, the user interface uh, design. So you can see from, from, from the initial one here to the, um, and the, the, the second version here, um, and I believe Adrian Richardson started to come on board about this time. My, my, my timings, because it was a long time ago, are, are a little hazy, uh, but th this, this is what version two looked like. It was much more uh, clean and, uh, and easy to work with, um, and, um, uh, and people seem to uh, find the, the interface a little bit nicer. Um, so uh, because this, this had uh, launched, um, the, the first version of DMP Online launched, in spring of 2010. And then there was the announcement from the National Science Foundation in the US that data management plans would be uh, required. And that got lots of people in libraries and research offices in US universities scurrying to, uh, to their um, internet browsers and, and looking for D DMPs because the National Science Foundation was not, uh, and this is an understatement, terribly prescriptive about what should be included um, in uh, those data management plans. So they started coming to us and, and, and saying, oh, I see that you're doing DMPs for the UK. Um, can we talk to you about how we might do something for uh, the US? So um, we uh, had the, the uh, International Digital Curation Conference in Chicago, Illinois, in December of 2010. Uh, and at that, we met um, a bunch of uh, US universities. And I'll, I'll give a shout out to Sherry Lake and Andrew Salins from the University of Virginia. Um, there's a picture there of Sarah Shreves, who was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and, and a consortium, basically, of US universities and projects came together to develop um, the US equivalent um, of DMP Online, which came to be called DMP Tool. And, and I um, uh, served as an advisor uh, on the, the project committee uh, or, the, um, or the board uh, for that. Uh, and um, that went down quite well, and, and our collaboration um, uh, eventually was um, um, included as a finalist for the Digital Preservation Coalition's Award for Research and Innovation in 2012. So we started to make friends, we started to get noticed, and we, we were beginning to grow. Uh, DMP Online version 3 launched in the spring of uh, 2012, again, uh, with, with a better uh, user interface, still with this, the, the same horrible logo that I put together um, in, in, a, in probably about four minutes, um, what one rainy afternoon, and I remember where I was when I did it, thinking, well, it's rubbish, but it'll do for now, it'll get changed. It actually lasted a lot longer than I expected, but I'm glad they have a proper one made by a real designer. Um, so that, that had um, new features like overlaying multiple uh, templates, uh, things that we take for granted now, like shibboleth authentication uh, and the API for systems interoperability. Um, cru crucially, we uh, promised more endorsement from funders. Uh, that did not always uh, come to pass, but um, uh, I, I guess Sarah in the next section will talk a little bit more uh, about that. So uh, I'm just going to leave you now with um, a, a, um, a slide that shows DMP milestones. This is something that I think not long after Kevin came in as, as director, uh, he asked me to, to produce a, a list of uh, what we did and when. So uh, really the roots of DMP online go back to uh, the autumn and winter of 2008. Um, but then the, the actual launch of DMP online uh, was in April 2010. So we are definitely still in the, uh, the, the, the 10 year um, decade anniversary year uh, of the first version of the system. Um, so I, I, I'm going to hand over to Sarah just now. Um, I will be around for the rest of the morning and, and afternoon, early morning if you're Sherry Lake in Virginia. Um, and um, and, and my, my contact details are there if anyone wants to get a hold of me afterwards. So thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you, Martin. Sorry about the interruption. This today has everything. <laughs> okay, so hopefully 
Um, if I share my screen and bring up my slides. Excellent. Okay, Wonderful. fingers crossed this holds out for the full 10 minutes. <laughs> Works. So what I wanted to do is think about the next phase of DMP Online, how we um, essentially developed our business model, started building the client base, and I framed it as 10 years, 10 lessons. So the first lesson, which I think is actually really appropriate for today, is don't panic. This is uh, Lance Corporal Jones from Dad's Army, for people who aren't from the UK and don't know the cultural reference. Given that I'm Jones, I think this is quite fitting, but also for all the issues we've had today. I think things always happen that are unexpected. So the first thing is don't panic. We, we were facing quite a scary prospect, um, to be honest, like when we had the removal of funding from JISC, um, you know, it was unexpected. Um, we had an active service in DMP Online and a growing user base, a number of people from overseas also um, using the service. We knew we needed to start charging to cover the maintenance cost because you know developers need paying as do help desk staff. Um, but we also knew that people were used to getting it for free. And to be quite honest, we, know, we obviously know wage bills, but it's hard to calculate what does this even cost to run? So it was a very kind of like mind blowing, scary time to try and figure out what to do next. But I think the primary thing you need to know is what your values are. Um, and when we were defining what we did with DMP online, I think you've got to be true to yourself. It really mattered to us that the code base remained open. So when I first approached Glasgow Uni and said, okay, we, we have this tool, we have customers, well, we have people overseas who want to use it, they expect to pay, how do we do this? They wanted us to protect the IP, set up a company, spin out. And that was absolutely not the way, well, it's not what I wanted from, from my career, but it wasn't the DCC values either. Um, we really wanted to try and keep free access to the tool wherever possible. So we didn't want to be charging researchers. Um, and this is what led to the freemium model. So it's an open source code base. Anyone can take the code base, run it themselves. Um, and we've put the charges on essentially added value services for institutions or for organizations that want all the admin data. And the next thing um, is, I, I think, just to be honest, this was work in progress for a long time. Um, and I think you've got to just accept that those things take time. Um, it, took us years literally to figure out what to charge and how to charge. Um, we kept telling people, you know, okay, yes, you can use this service. We'll give you access for free for now, but there will be a charge at some point. We didn't know when that would come in. Um, and there was way more work than we ever expected around the contracts, the SLAs, all the processes to set things up. So one message I would give to the colleagues who are now running DMP online is double or treble any time estimate and also don't beat yourself up about not getting stuff done. I remember sometimes you know I'd see an email from somebody that I'd responded to them a year earlier saying oh yeah we'll, we're figuring out our costs at the moment and I was horrified to realize a year had passed but there is always a lot to do and it's difficult work so try not to beat yourself up. And then also uh, another lesson was just sounding people out. So as I said, we kept telling people, you know, we are going to charge. It was very much a finger in the air when, uh, you know, we were thinking about the price range and we'd quote something on an email and get people's gut reactions. Um, I also spoke to people in a number of different unis to try and understand their positions. Was it easier to pay for a membership or was it easier to pay for like a service with a certain contract? So we did some very loose market research. Um, we probably should have done more, but you know, there's only so many hours in, in a day. And then we got to the phase like halfway through, okay, we have to just do this. We have to just put out our charges, start you know, developing the service and really ask ourselves, what's the worst that can happen? You know, we could end up with no customers. We could end up with some upset people. And we did have a few unis that were disgruntled because, you know, the charges came in, they couldn't put it into their plan. They found it difficult to transition. Um, but actually what happened was that we, we kind of grew very quickly. Um, I think it isn't quite 60 customers, but essentially we took on a lot of customers in a matter of months. Um, and it was, yeah, breakneck acceleration. I did feel like my neck was going to break at some points when I had all of these contracts to do and all of these inquiries to handle. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I think it's been for, for the best. 
so the next lesson that came out of that was that you need to grow your team. Um, and I cannot tell you what a relief it was when we knew we had, uh, you know, income for, well, initially one year was our contracts, but people kept asking for longer contracts. So many are now three year contracts, but that led us take on more staff. And that was a huge relief. You have less single points of failure. It's not all down to like individuals, like one developer, one person doing all of the liaison. So you can avoid that burnout and stress. And it also meant we could leverage different skill sets. So, so yeah, we grew the team, more developers, so they can focus on different areas um, and bringing in different people like Magdalena, who's done all of the customer development work. Let's see if this will actually advance now. Please advance the slide. Okay, next lesson, collaborate internationally. Um, we've been hugely lucky, you know, the work we do with the DMP tool in the States and also now um, the French, the DMP Operador using the code base. And there's massive benefits you get from that. Um, obviously two heads are always better than one. It means you bring in different perspectives, more insights. I think the decision-making is much richer as a result. And it also means that, that we get features for free sometimes. So there'll be something that the French have added to the tool and we can then just push it out and offer it to our customers um, without having to have done that extra work. So definitely having an international community around the code base is, is really valuable. And then picking up on community, also building the community of users. This is us all doing ax throwing in Manchester one time after a user group, which was a lot of good fun. And I think these social bonds are hugely important. And I have to really thank Magdalena for this. Um, she set up regular user groups, does monthly knowledge exchange dropping calls, um, you know, is doing the newsletter and the socials that we have. Um, and I mean, it, for us, this is very valuable because we manage to understand what you want from the tool. But I think it's also really useful to the people using DMP online that they have a peer network. Final two lessons out of 10, the one continue to innovate. Um, you're gonna hear more about this machine actionable DMP agenda, but as part of this international collaboration, we're trying to make sure there's better reuse of content so that things are more intuitive and customized. We can give tailored recommendations to researchers and effectively help everyone derive more value um, from the content that's in DMPs, both researchers, funders and unis. And my very final lesson is um, enjoy the ride. So this is from a, a DCC conference a few years ago um, on the DMP panel. And clearly you can see that you can have a lot of fun um, working in this space of DMPs. I really actually miss the work at DCC for that, um, but I'm glad to still be part of the community at a distance. I'll maybe have to get Jayant to get um, involved in DMPs. But that was my lessons and it's been a very enjoyable journey. I mean, tough at times, but very good seeing the community grow. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Sarah. Glad that the sound managed to hold in the end. And again, thank you for all the insights into getting DMP online where it is. Um, I really enjoyed uh, that, that talk and, and Martin's inside learning a lot and um, becoming more aware of um, the huge footsteps that I'm stepping in, um, trying to, uh, yeah, leave this team going forward. I don't think we have any questions yet in the chat. Um, so if you don't have questions for us, um, Magdalena has kindly prepared a few questions for you and uh, given me a little quiz uh, on Mentimeter to run. So if we all have devices at hand and I can figure out how to share the right screen, you can go to menti.com. So this is just a little fun quiz um, about um, 
DMP online. Um, 14 people so far are here. Wonderful. Uh, we're not sure what the price is yet. Um, so that, that can be negotiated in the end for whoever wins this. Um, do have 17 people playing, 18. And Forty in the call. I don't know. I don't blame anyone that doesn't want to play. But a lot of hearts coming in. Does anyone want to be number 20? Yeah, then I would say 20 is a good number to start. So let's kick this off. Um, I think you have 25 seconds to answer each question. Um, again, it's at like to whoever's quickest and right gets more, most points. And let's just see. Question one. Correct spelling of DMP online. And I have to say it's a mean one because it has changed over time. So everyone who's had communications from us lately should have picked this one up. We have five more seconds. Time's up. Yes, it's like lowercase o now, but all of you who picked it with a and uh, pick the old DMP online that was, was um, what was used um, in the past. I remember that, but the, actually the correct Duchess of spelling, the lowercase o. So that's the official registered one. So good. To, on the 15th, that got that right, and actually pay attention to all the, all the things that we send out. Next question. What's the official color? We all know you love the orange. But which orange is it? You're confusing us by making some of the oranges blue. Oh, is that what happens when you click? Yes, I thought the same. You have to look at the number. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, well done. The um, 14 that picked f49700 um they're all nice colors i have to say blue orange and particularly yeah yeah blue orange we should introduce some blue next time we do a rebranding it's essentially the scottish orange it's like the mix <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who have uh, an enhanced subscription you might actually not see that much of um, the, this beautiful orange because um, you have might have tailored your DMP online pages to your um, institutional colors. Right, next question. This is now like The test of who paid attention to uh, Martin's talk. On all DMP online interfaces.
and one where there were two correct answers. That's mean. But well done, um, those of you who picked 2011 and 2012 and uh, remembered from Martin's talk that this was basically how DMP Online looked at the start. We're halfway through. We don't have an intermittent leaderboard, which is a bit of shame. I'd be curious to see how people are doing, but that we'll see at the end. Question four. When did we get our first subscriber? Oh, only one person got that right. That's tough. I think our first subscriber was the MP Thule. Um, those, um, I mentioned it in our blogs that um, they were the, the first people we partnered with. And they are looking back to us, uh, uh, with us uh, on the blog today about the, the last four years with them. So even Sarah got that wrong. So no one, no one needs to be ashamed if they didn't get this question right. Question number five. is how do you reach us when you have issues? What's the correct email address to get to the DMP Online Help Desk? Which is a difficult one as well, because they all make sense. But yes, the majority got it right and has been in touch with us um, via the help desk or received messages from there. And it is always the best um, way to contact us. Um, as we've seen, the team has grown um, and this is the best way to get in touch and to make sure that it gets picked up by someone you're not waiting because someone is on, on leave um, or busy. And that's us on to the last question. What do you get with an uh, enhanced subscription? What do you, what can you do? As a subscriber you can't do on the basic subscription. And a lot paid attention to the question where we talked about uh, adding your own colors. You can actually do quite a, a lot of things you can um, add your own customized URL, you can add your logo, and you can even customize your static pages um, to your uh, institutional setups. I like the person that picked Unicorn Dust. Thus, uh, I really, really think we should try and find a way to make that possible. Absolutely, in a future release. Yes. As an and appropriate premium. It is, it, it, I mean, it is, uh, uh, this, uh, what's the, what do you call that? It's the official Scottish animal that you have on your passport for heraldic. So there, there should be unicorns around. I still have to find them, but um, yeah, working on the unicorn desk edition. 
And now. Let's see who did best. Oh, Martin, well done. Oh, and you said like you can get amazing. Really I didn't even make the leaderboard. Martin, very impressive. <laughs> what can I say, folks? <laughs> I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you have a better memory than me. I think I just got <laughs> old. <laughs> I was so impressed by all the things that you still find, found on your um, on your uh, discs in terms of all documents that uh, speaks to a um, good concept of um, digital preservation on and, your records. And so thank you for playing, um, everyone. And Martin, I don't know if we find a present for you at some point when we're allowed to see each other. You you get. Uh, um, unicorn dust, maybe. <laughs> yes, we'll figure out the, the unicorn dust. Um, thank you for playing, everyone, um, and do a little bit of a fun, fun bit here. Um, and now for the second half of this, uh, which is. Uh, Kindly, um, some of the funders and uh, other people that we work with externally um, reporting on um, their experience with the MP Online data management plans um, and any, uh, any plans they have going forward. And we're starting with um, Costas Lepanas from the European Commission. Um, and Carlos, I think, is here as well, but um, so I'm not sure. Uh, yes, we are, we are both here. Uh, we're both here, but I think yes, cost us. The presentation, and uh, we're happy oh. to answer any questions, both of us. So. Wonderful. Um, I'll hand over to you then. Do you want to? Yeah, are you happy thanks. to share your screen? Uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Wonderful. Thank you for joining. and. Um, giving us an insight into the, the plans of the European Commission. Okay. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, just to, to give you a bit of, um, of an update, really, on, on what's happening with uh, the MPs at the European Commission. And if we can go to the next. Um, uh, you have to minimize all your windows, I think. Are they are they not all minimized? Uh, it seems fine. There are some bars on the top. Ah, no, yes. Okay, great. So uh, first of all, uh, for us, it's all connected, uh, of course, to open science, which we give a lot of emphasis and and support in our uh, policy. Uh, we believe that uh, it can improve the quality, efficiency, and creativity of research. Um, it can help against the reproducibility crisis. And of course, uh, as we have seen also in the current pandemic that we are going through, uh, it has been really um, vital to be able to share uh, results of research very quickly and as openly as possible. And uh, this, of course, can help to create new research findings and also uh, reduce inequalities. Um, and uh, we connect, of course, correct data management um, and data management plans to uh, fair data. So for us, this is really interchangeable. And we see also a lot of opportunity costs that we are actually losing uh, of, because we don't have uh, fair data. Uh, and yeah, in the next uh, slide, you can see an evolution of our policies. So just to talk more about the data management plans, uh, that's a bit too fast. <laughs> okay. um, so we, we really started requesting uh, data management plans um, in 2014. So this coincided with the uh, open data research, uh, open research data pilot at that point. And um, after that, in 2017, this became um, the default uh, option for beneficiaries, but we used to allow, so in Horizon 2020, we used to allow to have exceptions. And that meant that if someone uh, would uh, opt out 
of the open research data pilot, they did not have to submit a data management plan. Uh, now, this will be a big change in Horizon Europe. And I think uh, tools like DMP uh, online help a lot is that anyone, even if they have reasons to not share their data, uh, they will uh, be requested to uh, submit a data management plan. And this will be uh, a sort of uh, no, no way out uh, option uh, for, for any beneficiary. So, uh, because we believe, as I said in the beginning, that this uh, basically is responsible data management and, and by having a DMP at the beginning of, of the project, at, at an early stage of the project, this helps uh, to, to have proper data management and eventually our goal is to have uh, reuse of, of those uh, data sets. And can we move on? So what we expect to see in Horizon Europe, uh, these are still uh, sort of uh, not, not fully uh, agreed upon, but very likely to, to happen. Uh, we will see also some early uh, research data management considerations at the proposal stage. So that they will be evaluated uh, before the grant is awarded, which so far was not happening. So it will be not a DMP uh, per se, but it will be something like a skeleton, let's say, of, of a DMP. But it is important to have this also at the evaluation uh, stage. And then, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, we want the data management plan to be uh, accompanying every single project. Uh, no matter whether uh, beneficiaries will share data openly or they are not able to, and they will ask for an exception. Uh, and ideally, and this is something that um, we have discussed with, <laughs> with uh, colleagues at DCC, but uh, we, we will see how this can become a reality, but we would like the DMP to be a living document that is updated through the lifetime of the project and to uh, again ideally be machine actionable and this can help both the beneficiary and the funder as we collect information at the end of the project and as we do an evaluation and the reporting for the project so this can be a whole uh, workflow that basically uh, beneficiaries do not have to uh, enter and re-enter uh, the same information again and again but this moves across the pipeline of, of services and what you state in your DMP in the beginning uh, actually can be your reporting at the end. So there, there's still things to, to figure out uh, there, but um, what we hope to happen with the DMP is that beneficiaries think about data early. So they don't wait until they have the data, until they publish, and then they decide what do we do with the data. But so we expect data to be uploaded in the repository uh, again, to the extent possible to have a PID associated and to have metadata in line with the fair principles. Uh, and again, depending on how things develop, uh, we have some uh, requirements that will um, uh, possibly make an obligation to use uh, repositories federated under EOS, the European Open Science Cloud, and to provide open access, uh, for example, with Creative Commons uh, licenses. And Next, please. Uh, one thing that we are actually pushing a lot in, in Horizon Europe and was not the case before is to mention strongly other research outputs. So we have been also in discussion with funders like uh, the Volcan Trust and others, and they have, for example, changed their, their, even their language and asked for data. Um, uh, uh, out, uh, how is it called? Not data management plans, but uh, research output management plans or something like that. So, okay, we did not do that, but we want to make sure that uh, other outputs, like for example, software or uh, protocols, workflows or models, or even to the extent, again, possible physical um, outputs uh, can be shared openly with, with others. Uh, they should also be described in the DMP. So we will encourage this uh, very strongly this is likely not to be a, a sort of legal requirement, but again, it's a cultural change and we want to see more and more outputs of those uh, Horizon Europe projects being shared with the wider uh, community. 
uh, in some cases, we, we are still working with uh, several stakeholders to even understand what this means. So for example, for software, uh, software is a special case. And although some of the uh, fair principles apply to, uh, to software as well as a, as a digital object, uh, we know that there are efforts uh, in RDA and in Elixir and in other places, uh, and we are in contact to, to see how, and, and then uh, I forget, not to forget the Research Software Alliance as well. So as people are adapting and uh, evolving the FAIR principles to cover uh, software more accurately, we want to be able to reflect that in the data management plans as well. Uh, again, this uh, from the funder side will be uh, required, and we hope that this um, will, will help us to address the reproducibility crisis and maximize the impact of, of new research outputs. Next, I believe we have an example. Yes. Um, so what we did during uh, when the pandemic started around uh, April, we launched the European COVID-19 data platform. And this was a collaborative uh, effort from the European Commission, MLBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, and Elixir, plus other partners and the member states. Um, so this was this is still because it's still being developed uh, and, and used by by many um, scientists and not only around the world. Um, this is uh, an example of fair data in action and, and what uh, correct data management should look like. Uh, especially addressing uh, the case of a pandemic where it matters a lot to have data quickly and as openly uh, shared as possible in line with the FAIR uh, principles. So this platform, for example, um, showed that the researchers need to have quick and unrestricted access to, to various data sources and that uh, the more this is done with correct data management, with the Amazon plants and fair data, uh, this helps uh, a lot in advancing and accelerating uh, research. And then uh, just a few words on, on what else uh, we did. This is both in relation to, to the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, we updated and launched new guidelines for Horizon 2020 projects um, to, to actually go beyond their uh, current obligations and to make an effort to have uh, more open data that can be quickly shared um, among, among the researchers. We also uh, launched a, a group in RDA for COVID-19 guidelines. And this was an amazing response with more than 350 people all around the world working together uh, to, to form guidelines on how to best share data under a health emergency. And uh, indeed, this was really an eye-opener on how quickly people work together and how RDA was able to uh, sort of uh, divide the work uh, into different subgroups and deliver in, in record time. And finally, um, we also collaborated with Open Air uh, to have a COVID-19 gateway, again, to enable better discovery of uh, data sets and other research outputs as well. And the next one, please. Um, so here's where we try to get a bit more practical, right? And we connect, as I said in the beginning, uh, fair data with responsible data management and the data management plan plays a very important role here. But be besides a funder requesting, uh, oh yes, share your data according to the FAIR principles, what does this mean in practice? And how can we make this um, sort of easier for, for beneficiaries to, to um, indeed follow the requirements? And how can we mainstream uh, FAIR practices across the scientific communities, uh, making sure that uh, when data are shared, uh, they're not just open data that cannot be reused, but they're data that have added value, they comply with the FAIR principles, and therefore they, uh, they will be reused by other people that can build on top of, of that uh, research. Uh, one thing we, we noticed was that um, it's not easy to compare uh, when you try to, to assign a sort of, um, not a score, but let's say, uh, does the fairness of, of the data set uh, and how, how can we move from something more abstract 
uh, to, to more concrete uh, indicators for fairness. And we have two examples that I want to mention very briefly, the RDA working group on the fair data maturity model and uh, the fairware initiative. So uh, the fair data maturity model was a group in RDA. Uh, now it's still a working group, but in the maintenance uh, phase. So the group worked for 18 months to, to actually develop a, a, what can be called a Lego uh, building blocks of fairness. Uh, which is in practice a set of indicators. Uh, it's about uh, 40, 40 plus indicators. So breaking down the fair principles of uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability to um, sort of give concrete uh, examples of what people should do to make their data uh, more fair and uh, explain in, in guidelines uh, what the indicator is about and how it can be satisfied. Uh, so we hope uh, there's, uh, there's actually a link in this slide. So uh, later when you, um, when we share the slides, you can see, we can, you can see that uh, we published this in the code data, data science journal as a paper. You can also have access to the RDA uh, recommendation. It's on the RDA website. Um, so this is an effort to both align uh, and harmonize fair assessment, but also it can be used as a, as a self-assessment tool by researchers. And uh, this would be interesting, I, I believe, moving forward to, to see how data management plans can connect to this sort of assessment to give an idea to, to a scientist, to a researcher of how am I doing, um, the way I plan to share uh, and store and um, uh, sort of archive data, uh, am I reaching a sort of level of fairness? Although we don't want to be very pres prescriptive and create new metrics that, uh, you know, people can be taken aback and, and say we, we don't need perhaps uh, uh, more stringent uh, metrics, but we see this as, as a change in, in the behavior of, of people and uh, sort of more uh, a self-improvement uh, tool. At the same time, the indicators can also be used by different uh, evaluation methods, like, for example, automatic evaluation of fairness, like uh, people are trying to do, uh, to have a common baseline and know that by using these indicators, we can actually perhaps um, have them reflected in a score, but be able to compare across different evaluation methods. And uh, the final slide. Uh, we can uh, mention briefly the Fairware Initiative, which is uh, coming from uh, the research on research institute that actually started from uh, World Camp Trust in the UK and other funders. And uh, we are collaborating through our um, Horizon 2020 Paris Fair project. And um, this fairware uh, initiative uh, ideally would like to create an open source tool to be able to judge the fairness uh, of, a, of a data set. But again, not to create um, a burden to, to uh, researchers and scientists by uh, sort of uh, only uh, introducing new, uh, new rules, let's say, for, for fair data, but to, to actually create this uh, different levels of, of maturity of, of a data set and, be able, uh, and scientists and uh, researchers be able to uh, improve their data sets. And at the same time, ideally uh, funders also being able to check or repositories being able to check whether a uh, data set complies with certain um, requirements uh, for, for fair data and fair digital objects. And um, I mentioned, of course, repositories because uh, this, and uh, there's one more slide, sorry, yes. Um, uh, repositories um, for us are actually even seen sometimes as a proxy. So if uh, the data are shared in what we call um, uh, fair enabling repositories, so uh, certified or trustworthy repositories, um, we can be uh, sort of more confident that uh, the data will be fair to a level that is acceptable. And Again, the fair data maturity model works uh, towards that phase. 
and um, we want to see that uh, more and more this is being taken up. Uh, and we are aware that we go basically from people that have not heard of, of uh, the fair principles to uh, people in disciplines that um, are very much uh, ahead and they're trying to, to create data sets that are, as we say, born fair. So it's not, we're not talking more about verification, but we're talking about uh, data that uh, from the get-go, they have a, a certain level of, uh, of fairness. Um, I think that's all from our side. I mean, my colleague Carlos is also here. If he wants to add anything or we're happy to take any questions and we want to have this um, closer collaboration with, with tools like uh, the DMP online in making all this a reality. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Costas and Carlos. Um, good teamwork there on the slides. Um, Molly said it would be super helpful to get a copy of the slides. I'm pretty sure that we can do that um, after the session. Um, as someone who's, when I'm not working on the MP online, working on fair as fair, uh, and exactly that uh, metrics aspect of it, um, I'm super curious to um, figure out how we bring those two together uh, in, in the future. So um, definitely if there's a, a role for DMP online in that area, we will explore that. Um, does anyone else have a question? Uh, could raise your hand if you want to unmute or type in the chat. And you can also keep on thinking um, and we can, we, we are behind our schedule because we had technical issues at the start, but there should still be a few minutes left at the end um, for any questions. If you want, we want to put, pick that up then. Um, thank you so much for the moment, Costas and Carlos. And yeah, I think you, you'll be here for a bit longer and um, we make the slides available and then people can get in touch should they have thoughts uh, at any later stage. So thank you so much. Um, which uh, leads us on to our next speaker, uh, which uh, is Patricia Clark for the Health Research Board in Ireland. And um, she will talk about their experience in developing a policy on fair data um, and um, the use of data management plans therein, which will be interesting to hear how much uh, it is similar to the uh, European Commission efforts and where things differ. Patricia, I can see you. Can we hear Hi. you? Good yes, morning. we can hear you. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and thank you very much for the invite um, f uh, to come and speak this morning. Um, I'll just share my screen if that's OK. That would be wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Got it. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. And uh, really talking to you about from the Health Research Board in Dublin. Um, so we fund health research in Ireland, but we also commit to building a strong and enabling environment for health research and to provide leadership for the review, conduct and governance of research. Um, we have a particular interest in open research, open science, and um, want to make sure that our, research, our funded research is open, accessible and reusable um, so that it can have the greatest impact. So we are involved in the broader open research agenda, but uh, data management and sharing is high on the agenda and has been something that we worked on quite a lot. Um, over the past coming the past years. Um, so I just want to take you through some of the partnerships that we worked with and where our policy actually fits into this. Um, so, I mean, this is very complex. We worked from 2014 to 2020. Um, we have a number of different partners that we work with um, and this has taken time to develop seven particularly that are key here that I mentioned and I just want to work you through where we actually got involved and what we've actually done with each of them in terms of sort of practical actions. So in 2014, we started off um, with research data is uh, evaluated under the research excellence part of our um, grant evaluation, and it still remains um, the same case. Um, 
great to hear the insights from the European Commission um, and where their thinking is going. And also back in 2014, we were uh, very exposed to the new EU policies under Horizon 2020, the EU discussions and all of the platforms and stakeholder groups that were being set up. But at this stage, we had um, no specific dedicated focus on research data, no dedicated tools that we used and no specific partners that we worked with. Um, move on to 2016. Um, where we start 2016, yep, yeah, where we started to look at uh, open science um, in greater detail. So for that, we held an open um, science conference in Ireland where we invited the uh, chair of the expert high level group on the European Open Science uh, Cloud and also the Irish uh, lead for the expert group on open innovation and all of the funders and key stakeholders in Ireland to give a position in open science and where they felt things were going to go over the next couple of years and what plans they had. And really this kicked off our national discussion we also published a report, um, which we called a Dazzle report, a data access sharing um, and linkage model, which where we were looking at how to reuse and how to get access to patient data or health data um, and how this could be developed in an Irish context. Um, we joined things like the European uh, Point of Reference Health Network from the European Commission as well, which has been um, very useful to set up links with other players. Um, in 2017, then we kind of um, we we had joined uh, the Science Europe dedicated working group of funders on research data, and we've had a long term relationship with Science Europe and working um, with them in research data, which we've found very useful. We also established three kind of key partnerships which are still uh, sustainable to this day. Um, looking first at a national level, we worked with the two departments of business, business enterprise innovation and um, Department of Education and Skills in Ireland and with the Health Education Authority who oversee the performance of the universities and um, to look at the broader open science agenda and um, set up a forum and um, pulled in players from policy, library sector, research performing, research funders and other key stakeholders to have a discussion on open research. And as part of that, um, to bring all of the open agendas together. So people who are involved in international um, partnerships, people involved in local, regional and national level discussions. Um, Patricia? Just yes. like a short thing, your slides don't seem to move um, for everyone else. We are still all on the on the um, starting slide. So if you oh, have moved okay. them across, then like that hasn't synced to Zoom. Do you want me to um, get your slides <laughs> yes. up instead? Like, yes, should we please. try that? Okay, give me a sec. I have unshared my screen. Apologies about that. Um, I, it's moving here on my machine. So yeah, you never know how these, um, you know, things work. Uh, which slide were you on? Um, just a uh, slide twenty seventeen. If that's okay. Um, I can keep talking while that's put up. I mean, the two other key partnerships that we have are the. Um, partnership with the GoFair International Office, um, where we worked with uh, the GoFair team to actually upskill uh, people who were already engaged in university and um, clinical trials facilities. Um, we connected them into a mentor scheme. Um, so they spent five days over in Leiden and then had access to workshops and um, developments back home. Um, we wanted them to sort of uh, be very au fait with the fair data agenda and to talk with a single voice um, and actually to network them and get to know them better. So we had one message across all of the institutions. Um, the second uh, or the third group that we worked with were F1000 researchers, the publishers, um, to bring an open public publication model for the HRB into the public sector in Ireland. So as part of that, they have a, a there's a open data underlying policy built in um, support for researchers to understand why this is necessary, give them advice and data repositories. And as part of that, we made it easy for them to use um, so we had F1000 staff who went around the country and talked directly to researchers um, and we provided a central APC model in-house and also a national steering group of champions from each of the different institutions to actually help on that. Um, so next slide. 
and I don't, I, they don't seem to be moving on my end, but I'm assuming they are. So for 2018, then um, we took the um, data um, stewards that were trained and mentored through the GoFair office and wanted to give them some hands-on practical experience of working with um, budgets um, and researchers. So we kicked off a fair data pilot. Um, and at this stage, uh, they went out to work with people through two of our largest funding schemes in the HRB and to sit and prepare DMPs and to look at how much it would cost um, and how it would work for, for different institutions across the system. Um, F1000 then were working with researchers to look at uh, the open publishing. And we also signed um, the DORA um, statement to support all of this work um, and to look beyond sort of journal impact factors, which we'd never really stressed um, within the HRB, just to make it explicit of how we actually did more work with our um, more work with our panels and with how we actually sort of explicitly sort of work to a uh, to recognize the underlying value of the entire research portfolio um next slide so in 20, 2019 then um things became very busy. So we had some internal awards from herself. We took our Dazzle data linkage model, data linkage and storage model, um, and we funded a proof of concept with our high performance computing uh, group working with the health service executive. Um, we ran a secondary research data um, reuse um, call where we funded six different partnerships to work on reuse of existing data sets. Um, and we also funded our, our published our policy. So it wasn't until 2019. So it's like five years after we started looking at this that we actually funded a dedicated policy in this area. So the policy that we have is for all um, calls from the 1st of January 2020, um, all have to make their, expected to make their data, underlying data available, and um, plus the materials around um, the research data. So software and other things that were mentioned by the European Commission. Um, we expect the metadata at a minimum to be available and also recognize that some areas can't be open, but there are other ways of reusing data behind secure walls, whatever. We looked at um, DMP, we request DMP at two points um, for those contracts that are successful projects, um, just post-contract and also at the end of grant. So it is a living document. Um, and as I say, we, we clarified what we would pay for, um, what our budgets are, and we also, um, included a declaration from institutions and um, that people would work with some of the expertise and the data stewards that are in-house so it was also at an institutional level um, we also worked with the Science Europe Working Group and were a member of the team that looked at the international alignments of the Research Data Management Guide, um, which we adopted within the HRB. Um, and we started to work with DMP online um, and prepared a HRB template um, for people to use. We did at that stage um, refresh the data guidelines with F1000 as well to look at data availability statements um, and to make them more fair orientated. And at a national level, we published our national framework um, on transition to open research, um, which included a um, dedicated working group on research data. Um, we have since appointed a national coordinator um, and there is now a wider working group that's working under phase two, um, which is looking at um, enabling fair outputs for research. Um, so there are lots and lots happening um, and things speeded up quite a lot. Um, just to move to 2020 then. Um, Really, 2020 has again picked up speed. So um, despite COVID, we've joined an Irish ORCID consortium to look at better use of uh, persistent identifiers um, and to make sure that ORCID's integrated into all of the work that we did. Um, we hosted an international panel to look at the DMPs that were submitted, submitted with the support of the um, data stewards. Um, so we had a one day session where we had um, Sarah, thank you very much for attending that and for six other leading experts from abroad to sort of look at the DMPs alongside the institutional reports that we have. Um, and we piloted the use of a new uh, Science Europe uh, assessment rubric um, to do that. We've learned a lot from the first fair involvement and we're looking at some changes in house um, based on the work of that EU project and involvement that we have in the high level advisory group. 
um, we committed to working with F1000 to look at a new publication type. So um, from 2021, we will have um, publication possibility for um, DMPs, um, which will credit data stewards, be machine actionable um, to RDA community standards um, and look at really best possible use of metadata and persistent identifiers. We're also participating in two new EU initiatives, um, the Coordination and Support Action for Population Health Research Infrastructure for COVID, which actually had a meeting, first meeting this morning, and also the Joint Action on European Health Data Space, um, which will come online and kick off in December, January this year. And we think that these two are really important and they pull in the Department of Health and the Health Service Executive as well. As I say, we've kicked off phase two of our national um, coordination discussions. We have a new national coordinator appointed, uh, funded by government departments, and we're looking at landscape reports and national prioritised actions. Um, and finally, we're, we have tendered for a DMP infrastructure service um, to look at the flow of DMPs through the system um, from the HRB with the research institutions, um, with the declaration from institutions, um, with research evaluators and with the HRB itself. And we are intent to contract with the DCC for this work work. Um, and then just to next slide, just to leave you with a very final um, point on some of the things that the new things that are coming down the track in um, next year. Um, so first of all, um, I mentioned the European health data space, and that is something that we really want to get a grip on. Um, we are talking to GoFair about the metadata for machines workshops and a HRB fair data profile. Um, we we'll look to finalise contracts for a DMP infrastructure service. Um, we we'll look at the first publication of DMPs um, and also uh, something new, um, working with the Central Statistics Office to look at how researchers can access the Irish COVID-19 data hub. Um, so for us, this is kind of a new game in that it brings the two legislations together and look at how they interact, the Public Sector Statistics Act and the health research regulations. And finally, we know there's lots more that we need to do in terms of uh, providing guidance and license on budgets, on exceptions, on sort of spelling out on the as open as possible, as close as necessary maxim. Um, and we hope that the DCC and the DMP online will be part of that work with us. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Patricia, for that. I've been told that my screen sharing didn't work 100% either, so <laughs> I don't know what's wrong today. Um, but uh, yeah, again, we, we, we will hopefully get the slides to people so they can catch up um, uh, on anything uh, that they might have missed. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for that insight into um, the um, efforts in Ireland. We do have uh, some people from Irish institutions on the call who are really excited to work with you on that. And um, I can see on behalf of uh, the DCC and the DMP online team, um, um, yeah, we are uh, happy to collaborate in that area um, as well. That looks really, really interesting and um, uh, good effort. People are complimenting your references. Uh, that's an EU directive that I'm not entirely sure I'm super familiar yet with, but um, something that we, that uh, Jerry from Dance is mentioning, that that's good. So thank you so much for that. Are there any questions to Patricia? Just compliments so far in the chat. So, <laughs> nothing else then. Um, thing as we are behind time, uh, it's, I think we'll move on to our last speaker. Uh, and I appreciate very much that she's joining us because it must be incredibly early for her to join us from Indiana. Um, and that will be Natalie Myers, who um, is one of the chairs on the um, RDA group 
on exposing data management plans um, that we as DCC and the DMP online team have been involved in uh, as well. And um, she'll report on the work that that group has done and she's still on the call. Hi, yeah, great she to is. see you. Yeah, wonderful. Sorry, I'm, I'm like, I'm not, I was a little bit paranoid that uh, I, we might have lost you. Seeing no, as this great. is how things go today. <laughs> it's great to still be with you. Thank you, Patricia. And um, thank you other Patricia for the um, great talk. That was really inspirational. Um, I wanted to um, give a shout out to um, members of the Research Data Alliance um, Exposing Data Management Plans Working Group and invite all of you to um, please join me if you'd like by opening the slides. Um, I've posted a link to you in the chat that you can use to open the slides. If you can't see my share screen, hopefully you can. Um, but feel free to follow along on your own. Um, that'd be awesome. And I welcome your participation um, in this talk. I'll be sharing lots of links. And um, that way we can visit and celebrate a bunch of things DMP, because this is a party after all. Um, let's um, look forward now to um, uh, some things we can celebrate on the um, 10th anniversary of the DMP online tool. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Research Data Alliance exposing DMPs working group. There are over 80 of us representing diverse geographic professional and subject areas. Um, I'd like to thank my co-chairs, especially um, our leader, Angus White, from DCC, who I think is here with us today. Um, great to see you online, Angus. I've been missing seeing you in person. Also, Marie, Christine, Fiona, and Catherine from um, Australia, uh, France, and the UK. Um, we are a small but um, mighty group of co-chairs. And we started with a simple premise. Um, that's not such a simple thing to achieve. Um, we set out to find out how stakeholders feel about sharing DMP content, about when is the right time, what content is right for sharing, and who is interested in uh, data management plan content. I'd like to invite you to join me on Menti. Um, go to menti.com and use the code 9879790. So we're going to go to menti.com, code 9879790. You can pick that up in the chat or I'm going to paste a little link in there um, that should make it easier. Let's see if that works. Um, feel free to give that link a try and it should bring you over to Menti or take a, a screen snapshot of the QR code on my screen and that'll blast you over there too. Um, what I'd like to do is um, welcome you. Um, to uh, the working group and to RDA itself. If you're not familiar with the Research Data Alliance, it's free to join. And there you can meet a number of researchers and stakeholders in uh, research data management, um, sharing and best practice from all around the world that you'll find have similar aims um, to your own. So um, please visit um, menti.com and uh, use that code and let's find out if you're a member. Um, looks like 16 of us are and um, hopefully some more of us will join. Um, what um, I'm curious about is um, whether you might have seen the Research Data Alliance exposing data management plan recommendations yet. We're going to talk a little about those um, next in uh, my slides. So um, I beg your patience if you've already seen them. If you haven't seen them, I'll give you a little preview and opportunity to give feedback on those recommendations. They're still in um, draft. 
Um, but before we get there, let's think about um, how do we find out in the first place what people are interested in sharing when it comes to DMPs. For that, our uh, working group um, took a survey of stakeholders in Research Data Alliance and our um, participating uh, stakeholder partner organizations, including DMP Online Tool. Um, we have an openly shared survey instrument and open data available online. I invite you to visit that after the talk. Um, the good news is um, for those stakeholders who responded, hooray, DMP Online brought the most stakeholders to our survey. Um, 249 of our 500 some respondents um, came from DMP Online users and clicked through via um, a share to DM online stakeholders. So that was really fun. Happy birthday, DMP online. You've got the most engaged stakeholders. Um, our other top partner organizations for the survey came from um, the American and um, US counterpart of DMP online, the DMP tool, which now have a joint code base you heard about earlier. And um, the RDA DMPs um, group that I'm a part of, but also um, our partners in France and Switzerland and all around the world. So um, the responses you see in our survey are truly international, and I think they inform what people are looking at um, when it comes to DMPs. The other thing that's interesting about our survey data is that among those who responded, um, unlike some um, surveys of this kind, um, we have a preponderance of researchers responding. So we get a really strong impression from researchers about their stakeholder interest in DMPs. Um, following researchers, our next most prevalent uh, stakeholder to respond were data managers. Um, following that, those who um, engage with DMPs in their role as peer reviewers, librarians, repository managers, or those who actively develop or create DMP tools. Um, you can visit the results of the um, RDA Exposing Data Management Plans Needs Assessment online. And um, I think that um, that uh, will reward you. Let's take a quick glance at what that looks like. Um, here you can see um, all of the questions and uh, visualization of the data that um, we found out about people's um, familiarity with DMPs, um, when they thought um, DMPs should be exposed and how. Um, so there's a lot of valuable information in that survey. The data and the visualizations are open, so um, please visit. Um, the uh, thing that we were curious about in particular was what people might see as the negative uh, impacts of exposing their DMPs. 46% um, were concerned about exposing sensitive information some were afraid there might be negative perception of any changes or variances between how they shared and what they'd originally said in their DMPs. Others were worried about getting scooped. Um, when we asked about what conditions or guarantees should be considered when deciding to expose data management plans, um, stakeholders were interested in um, being able to make selective disclosure. In other words, um, share certain portions of their DMPs and not others, or share to um, people uh, on an embargo period so that they might share with uh, funders and peer reviewers first or inside their own organizations and then to the general public later. And um, for that, they wanted access control over uh, what parts of their DMPs were shared and with who. Um, let's look at what the positive impacts uh, they saw were. Um, they're mostly interested in the positive impact of improving transparency and being able to see shared DMPs as exemplars um, for creating their own. And um, some stakeholders were interested in seeing shared DMP content 
so they could better evaluate the cost of data management and do resource planning. Others were interested in using shared DMPs to increase research visibility generally, either for their institutions or their own labs. And among um, developers particularly was um, interest in shared DMP content that would enable interoperability with other systems. Um, so I invite you to visit the survey data and um, take a look at the results. I hope it will be informative for you. And it's one of the outputs of the RDA Exposing Data Management Plans Working Group. So thank you to all our stakeholders, particularly DMP online users who um, filled out the survey. Um, your responses were valued and you can visit your responses in aggregate here online. And we welcome the chance to um, interact with you more um, when you see how we've taken your responses and integrated them into the exposing data management plans recommendations. Um, if you haven't visited the recommendations, um, one of the easiest ways to visit them is in my slides, click the link for using this form, and it will take you to um, a page that looks like this, and it will guide you through the recommendations, giving you an opportunity along the way to um, provide your input on each component of the recommendations. So you'll be able to see for each recommendation number, uh, an opportunity and a definition to learn more about the recommendation, and then to tell us whether it's ready for adoption or needs some rewording. So please visit if you haven't already. Um, you can get there um, using the link I'm copying in the chat. And with that link, you can uh, go to the forum yourself and give us a little bit of input about um, how the recommendations will work for you. Um, and we welcome all new members in the Exposing Data Management Plans Working Group. So if you're not a member yet, um, use the link in the chat to please join us. And you'll hear as the recommendations evolve. Um, now let's look at um, the uh, other outcome we have um, related to data management plans to share today. Um, I wanted to share with you um, the uh, results of a report focused on recommendations for research institutions that provides additional guidance for publishers, tool builders, and professional organizations. Um, this report on a implementing effective data practices uh, was co-organized by the Association of Research Libraries, the Association of American Universities, and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. We convened experts from the um, library, research, and scientific communities and spent about a day and a half together in a December 2019 workshop. It seems like a million years ago, but it was only 11 months. Um, the funding came from NSF and we got together for two specific reasons. Um, one of those was to um, implement uh, the specific data practices the NSF was interested in related to persistent identifiers or PIDs for data sets and to look at how to create machine readable data management plans or DMPs for funded research projects. After the workshop, we continued to work together through spring 2020 to provide key recommendations for effective data practices to support a more open research ecosystem with an emphasis on FAIR. Um, I invite you to um, visit the report um, online, you can do that at the ARL website using the DOI at the bottom of the slide. Um, it will take you to a page like this, I believe. I'll paste that in the chat. 
and you can use that link to visit the report on implementing effective data practices stakeholder recommendations for collaborative research support. These recommendations are primarily geared toward institutions, particularly universities, in helping them support the ecosystem of shared or active DMPs. Um, the other thing I'd like to share with you that um, we are particularly keen about is our stakeholders themselves. Um, our stakeholders uh, generously um, gave us pre-conference interviews um, to help us prepare for the workshop. These are stakeholders from scholarly societies, the research communities, our funding agencies, research libraries. Um, they've shared uh, snippets from their interviews out um, on uh, YouTube. And I invite you to um, visit the blog posts ARL has put up um, as an umbrella for those YouTube snippets. Um, you can visit those at ARL.org um, on the uh, blog category. It will take you to a page like this. And I'll paste a link to that in the chat for you. Um, if you go to that link, what you'll see are um, a series of three uh, blog posts um, talking about why the work matters for PIDs and DMPs and active DMPs. And you'll see interviews from stakeholders like Ben Pearson from Gates Foundation, Clifford Lynch from CNI, Jason Gerson from PCORI, Margaret Levenstein from ICPSR, Gina Paltu from National Library of Medicine. And I think you'll enjoy to hear what they have to say. And the interviews can be accessed on these snippets on our YouTube channel at ARL. Um, they're short, like a minute or two at the most, um, little tiny snippets. Um, that will help you engage with the perspective of various stakeholders surrounding um, sharing uh, DMPs and using PIDs for data sets in such a way that we can make the content from DMPs more interoperable in university settings, higher education, and laboratory research, not just for compliance, but to encourage uh, support for those who have research data sharing mandates and to help others benefit from the shared data in uh, DMPs. So I encourage you to visit it, um, listen to those YouTube interviews. They're a lot of fun. Um, I really appreciate the chance to spend this morning with you. I've learned a ton. Um, so happy birthday, DMP Online. Um, you've uh, created a world of opportunity for us to open up not only how we think about data sharing and benefit from it as researchers, but also to think about how we can build better systems that interoperate against that um, active content in data management plans, um, which really are a window uh, to funded research and to some of the solutions that we need to build a better world together um, through our research projects. So happy birthday. Um, it's been a fun morning with all of you and uh, great to celebrate this anniversary with you. Thanks a bunch. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was wonderful. And that's a lot of material for people to follow up with. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we're, yeah, really excited, glad to have um, Angus sharing the group with, uh, uh, with you folks and um, constantly giving us uh, ideas on um, where we could improve DMP online um, to uh, implement some of the recommendations and make the whole world run better. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. We're also at the end of our time I'm very much aware that we've kept you all for quite a bit and we make use of the full two hours due to all kinds of difficulties. I don't think I've ever run a Zoom call like that <laughs> that had like every every possible thing go wrong. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. 
Is my yes, audio working? Can. Ah, it is. Okay. So, so no, no question from me. Um, but I just wanted to say like how impressive it is given all the tech issues all the way through this, the number of things that have gone wrong, just how smoothly you've run it. So big congratulations on that. Um, and I think that I was impressed by the range of talks, kind of looking at the history and then where different funders are going and where we can take things now, you know, that now that we've actually got so much content in these different systems, how we can leverage that and, and connect up different systems um, so no it's impressive to think where the tool's going um, and yeah proud to have been a part of it so excited to see what you do next thank you and uh, I can only say this is due to the, the wonderful community you have built mainly the, the fact that everyone is uh, willing to celebrate with us and um, give a give a short talk um, it's really down to the, the incredible work that you've put in and I'm just um, trying to keep things up uh, over the next <laughs> <laughs> few months and years. Um, so thank you everyone for, for making the time to join us. Um, we will double check uh, what we've sent out <laughs> in terms of uh, information to connect on Friday. So, um, you know, keep an eye on, on uh, your inboxes. Those who've decided to join us for both sessions, um, we'll double check to make sure um, that Friday uh, uh, runs smoother than today, hopefully less technical issues. Uh, as interesting talks, um, actually quite a, a, a nice follow-up, I think, from where we ended. Um, a, a lot more insight into international collaboration and uh, where data management plans might be going in the future. So um, I'm excited for Friday. We'll double check to make sure that technology doesn't let us down. Thank you everyone for joining and celebrating with us. Um, we'll try to get this recording and the slides out. So everything that hasn't worked, you can catch up with. And again, um, thank you so much to all our speakers, uh, the DMP online team from the past, plus uh, funders like uh, Costas, Carlos, Patricia. Um, we couldn't be doing this as successfully, I guess, without your support and uh, the wonderful community that uh, exists around this in various uh, research data alliance working groups. So it's lunchtime in the UK. Uh, I think this is a good time to wrap up and for uh, all of you to have a break and some food, more coffee, whatever. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, see you again. Um, Yep, thank you. On Friday or on Twitter uh, and on the blog. You, you're a wonderful community. Thank you so much. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.